All right, here we go. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us again for June's uh, episode. I call them episodes now because it's almost like a, a video podcast um, of June 2023. Uh, build your own app in 30 minutes uh, this week for Learn with Google. I'm uh, very excited. Uh, we're going to be looking at a great tool called AppSheet, um, and you'll hopefully know a little bit more about it by the time we're done. Uh, I would just like to start off though, by welcoming uh, you all and acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet and those whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land, wherever you happen to be. And we've got all those lovely images there that um, represent all different uh, parts of uh, Aboriginal country. Uh, and we'd like to honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. And then flipping slightly east, from here, we have New Zealand, Steve. There you go, better come off mute. Uh, kia ora, Chris. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, tihei maori ora. Uh, Ina maunga whakahi. Ina wai tukukiri. Uh, ki te tūpuna, tēnā koe, tēnā koutou kato. Um, this is not a, uh, a fancy replaced background. I'm coming to you today from the Forest Hill Primary School Library, uh, about to do a workshop with some principals. So great to see everyone in tonight. It's all this afternoon, depending on where you are. Lovely, and you won't be able to stay the whole time with us, unfortunately, but I'm um, glad you could be here for the start. And just, uh, we usually just introduce the team, um, and I'm very pleased to say the team has grown a little bit. So uh, I know many of you on the call know a lot of the Google for Education team, and for those that don't, uh, that's why we put the slide up. Um, but Darren Macalino, Darren is on the call. Darren, do you just want to say hi and just let people know what you do on the team now? Hey guys, so um, unlike the slide, I am a uh, not an education solution engineer. That sounds really, really cool though. I'm a customer success manager here with the uh, the team. I'm based in South Australia, I'm a former educator, and I used to work at the Department for Education. So excited to uh, see how uh, how this runs. Thanks, Chris. No worries. Thanks, Darren. Oh, that's what happens when I just cut and paste and, and I'm in a hurry. <laughs> My apologies for that. And we also have Harris. Harris just joined us on the um, education sales team. Uh, he's specifically looking after Chromebook sales for Australia and New Zealand. So it's nice to have two new people on the team doing awesome stuff. Uh, right. Fantastic. And Darren, you're welcome to stay around as long as you would like to. Um, more than happy for that. Uh, today, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a Smaller, smaller list of things, but each of those things will unpack, I think, a little bit. Um, the, we're looking today at building an app with a great Google tool called AppSheet. Um, and it's maybe you've used it, maybe you haven't. I, I find a lot of people don't even know it exists. Um, and so it's cool to tell you about it. Um, the neat thing about it is if your school is using Education Plus, you get it for, well, not free, but included. Um, it's part of Education Plus. You actually get AppSheet Core, which is the sort of the semi-fancy version. There is a slightly fancier version, but it's it's fancy enough for anything you would like to do. Uh, you get it included with the paid edition of Workspace. Um, and then, of course, as usual, we'll look at some of the new stuff that's coming up for Google for Education uh, since we last spoke a month ago. All right, so um, just a little intro to AppSheet, and then I'm going to switch machines here and try and actually build an app for you in about 30 minutes, and we'll see how we go with that. Um, well, Chris, hang on, Chris, hang on. You, you yes, just talking crazy. Days. Building a whole app in less than 30 minutes, that sounds madness. I, I know. Um, it, it's its amazing how some of these app building tools, we used to, uh, we used to do a thing called, oh, what was it called? Um, Android App Inventor, um, which I think is still around. Um, and I remember once I did a, uh, a demo slam with that, and I built an app from zero to nothing in three minutes. So um, it is possible to build apps really quickly, um, but I reckon 30 minutes is, is, we'll see how we go. Um, the neat thing about AppSheet is it's it's no code. So you don't need to know any coding. And the reason it's called AppSheet is it actually connects to a sheet. So um, if you want to just start at sort of the entry level, it starts with a Google Sheet. Uh, you can connect it to larger data sources if you want. So you connect it to like a you know a data connector with you know I guess BigQuery or other things. You can connect it to other data sources. But I think for for what most of we would probably want to do in a school, connecting it to a Google Sheet is a nice simple solution. Um, I uh, well, actually I, I'll try and give you this slide deck. Um, I'll drop this slide deck in the chat. So then you have a link to it uh, right here. And Chris, I think the, the connection's two-way, right? You can either go from a, a sheet to an 
to an app or from the app to a sheet, can't you? Kind of, it goes both ways. You can, you can, and um, and I, look, I, and I'm going to preface this by saying, as, as part of today's session, I am going to try and build an app for you, so to show you how it works. I am not an expert in this. There's a lot of stuff that this does that I have no idea about, but I think I know enough to whet your appetite and just give you a little taste of what it can do. And, and it's fairly straightforward, I think. Um, I've built a few things with AppSheet. Um, I've built a few little apps for some friends. I built myself a superannuation tracker because I wanted to see how my superannuation, superannuation was, was going, so I built one of them for myself. Um, last year at Edutech, the uh, the, the um, registration form for the teaching theatre wasn't really working the way we wanted uh, from the Edutech people. So we built an app in. Oh, sorry, I built an app in um, in uh, AppSheet just like a couple of days before the event. So it is possible to build something fairly sophisticated pretty quickly. But I'm going to try and show you how to do that. Uh, and if there's no other questions, I will get started and show you exactly what I mean. And this is one of those um, one of those features that may not be switched on for your domain. So if you if you do have plus and you go to try and use it, you go, hang on a minute, it's not there. And maybe you need to have a chat to the admin and just say, hey, can we switch that on, please? Um, and there's a few little different T's and C's, obviously, in there. But yeah, if you can't see it and you do have plus, a check if you have a license assigned to yourself, uh, and b well, that's two. Yeah, b um, check it's turned on for your domain as well. Is always kind of the the hot tip with all these sorts of things. And the great thing about AppSheet is that um, there are a whole pile of templates um, that you can grab and just kind of either change to what you want to make them do or just use them as is. And as Chris said, you know, they can they can connect to all sorts of stuff. And there's a whole lot of APIs that plug into them as well. So there's one called um, called Vision API, which is a which is something that, that recognizes things when you take photos of them. So, um, you know, if you had a, if you're building an app, you want to take a photo of something and do some image recognition, you can plug in all sorts of APIs. So you can go from, as Chris said, you know, super simple to pretty complex in a couple of steps. Nice, thanks, Steve. And thank you for singing and dancing. I know that wasn't what you were intending to do, but I realized I needed to do a couple of things to connect on this other machine, so that worked well. Well, I thought I, I thought I could maybe uh, do a little singing, song and dance while you were trying to do two things at once, because I know I struggled with two, two things at once, so I'm, I'm really impressed. Yeah. Um, so I've got a sheet here, and I'm I'm going to. So here's my thought. I was trying to think last night. What can I? What, what can we build together that it might be educationally useful? And I started to think about like a like a, a citizen science type project. So you know when you might send the kids out and they're gathering things from around the local area. And I originally thought when I was brainstorming this last night, I thought. You know, I might build an app, one of those apps where, as you wander, I don't know if it's like this where you live, but sometimes when I wander around, people have just dumped their shopping trolleys. Like, like they go to Woolies or Coles and they take their shopping trolley and they just very rudely leave it somewhere in the hope that someone comes and the magic fairies will come and pick it up. Um, it'd be nice to have an app where you could go around and actually report the, the, the missing trolleys, right? And so something that would geolocate them, allow you to take a photo of them, and then do something with that and then i thought well you know you could you could build a similar app that we could go around and just in your local area you could go and collect examples of all the the flora and fauna in your local area you could um uh i think steve you had a suggestion before of like inside a school if there was things in the school that needed repairs or were damaged or whatever you could report those so i'm going to try and build an app that has um uh, the ability to go around and take photos and geolocate things and create a list of, of what you're capturing. So that's the plan today. So I will just go over here to this AppSheet link here. So this is what you get when you go into AppSheet itself. So this is AppSheet.com. When you go in there, you'll see I've got a couple of things I've already started making. Um, and you'll just sign in with your Google account. And so long as your Google account has um, the Plus license attached to it, you'll get access to all these features. And then creating a new app, I go Create, App. And you can either start with the database or build the app. So I'm going to start with existing data, or you can start with a template. Now, I like to start, now, different people have different approaches to this. I'm just going to show you the template thing, because it's kind of cool. I'm not going to use it, but I think it's amazing that this is here. These are all the templates for apps that currently exist. So you can see if you want to make a workstation booking app, or an order delivery tracking app, or facility assets, or class attendance. Um, you know, team directory, there's tons and tons of things in here that are already pre-built and you've just got to open one up and then change your 
you know, your little piece of however you want it to work, you know, just customize it to your own use. So there's lots there. You can probably find exactly what you want in here. But I'm not going to do that only because I find out whenever I start learning to do something using a template, I don't really understand what I've done. So I like to start from scratch. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to click on this create button, go to app and start with some existing data. Now, the existing data is this spreadsheet over here. So I'm going to call it um, uh, uh, local area tracker, right? And you can use it to track whatever you want. So I'll call it local area tracker. And when I open up my app sheet and go app, start with existing data, I'm going to tell app sheet to look at that spreadsheet. So uh, what did I do? Why, why did I do that? App, start with existing data. There we go. So I'm going to create a new app and we'll call it um, local tracking. G tracking, that's uh, appropriate. And the category, we'll just add a category. I'm just going to call it education and training for now, right? And now I'll choose my data source. So I go in here and you can either click connect to an app sheet database or to Google Sheets. I'm going to choose Google Sheets. And it's going to go in there and look in my Google Sheets collection and find, hopefully, what do I call it? Local, I'll just search on the word local, local area tracker. So there's the sheet that I made, right? So I'll just hit select and select that. And that will then bring that sheet in as the back end for this app. And <laughs> really? Why? Creating app. This is exactly the sort of thing you want to happen while you're giving a demonstration. It, it says that it says that one's empty. Have you have you got one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, okay. is that the I, other one you want to? Oh, no, the other one that you've got data on. I know what I have to do. Um, so so okay. Let's think. Let's think it through, team. Feel free to unmute your microphone and speak if you want, or drop it in the chat. If we're creating an app that we're going to collect things from around the local area, what are the different categories we need? And I'm going to start off by saying the first thing you need always is an ID. And if you're not a database person, just understand that when you create any sort of list that's going to act as a database, it has to have some sort of an ID. And when we put that in there, it'll generate that for you. Now, the other thing we might want to have, uh, we might want to have the time. Well, let's start with the date. So we might want to have the date. We might want to have the time. We might want to have, um, uh, well, location. What is. So we'll call it, um, uh, well, let's call it uh, whatever we're taking a photo of. So we'll call it subject. Okay, we can rename these things later. We'll call it subject. Uh, and then we might want to take the location of where that is. Uh, what else might we need? We said we we're going to take a photo. So let's stick in a photo. Uh, and we might want to make some notes or we'll add notes. Sorry, not notes, notes. Uh, anything else we need that you can think of? Maybe who found it, if you want to do a, a uh, one. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I love it when you use that tone of voice. You're like, maybe not Steve, but I'll just say <laughs> yes to keep you happy. <laughs> uh, we'll put like listed by. Okay. Yeah, nice. That's that's even better. So we'll do that. Now, um, so there's a couple of things. Now that I've got some things in there, and you should always do this in a sheet, by the way. You should always pull down that line so you, that you lock in that top row. Okay, so let's go back to app sheet now. Let's try that again. So I'm going to go create app, start with existing data. We'll call it local. Tracker and the category is education. And if I run out of time to do this, I'm going to show you one I've built earlier, right? And I just want to show you the process. So choose my data. My data is in Google Sheets. It's called local something. So we'll search on that and local area tracker. Fantastic. And hopefully, our fingers crossed, it finds a sheet with some categories in it and it knows what to do with it. By the way, uh, I'm a Google certified trainer and I'm using my trainer account to do this. And if you're not a trainer, one of the perks of becoming a trainer is you actually get access to your very own domain and you have you can do all this sort of stuff. You can play in the garden, so to speak. Okay, so this is great. So it's syncing the app and it's bringing it in and it's telling me it's good to go. Syncing, syncing. Okay, and there you go. So, so there's my app. It's already made for me. I just have nothing in it just yet. So let's let's customize the app. Let's make a couple of changes. So these are the categories, and you like ID, date, time, subject, location, photo, notes listed by. It's exactly the same as the headings that I had on the sheet. It's just brought the sheet in 
as the headings there. It's done a couple of clever things. You might notice it's recognized that my date field is in fact a date type of field. There's all different types of fields you can have there, right? So you can do all sorts of things with that data, but it's recognized that what I call date is in fact the date field and what I call time is in fact the time field. It's recognized that photo is an image field and notes is a long text field. So it's been pretty smart in just interpreting what things should be. So that's that's neat. Um, so now we've done that. Um, we've established the data source. So this button on the side here is your data source. I'm just going to do one little thing on my Chromebook here. And that is to turn on the accessibility feature that shows you my mouse because it makes it much easier. It's this one here called mm, show the mouse cursor when it's moving. There you go. That's better. It's a nice feature. Um, all right. So, so that's that. Then the next thing you create, once you've established your data source, you create views. Now, a view is how you want the thing to look. And you get some different views. So right now, this has um, nothing in it. So it's going to be a bit hard to tell. Let me, let me show you what I had made earlier. It's going to be a lot easier to understand. Now that you understand that like, you create a sheet and you simply create a new project based on that sheet, let me go back to one that I've made and then just will speed this process up a little bit. So I've called it my local area. And you can see when this loads that I've actually gone out and collected some things already. I just went for a little walk around at lunchtime, took a photo of some flowers and a few things around where I live. And, and you can see I've done it. It's a similar kind of thing to what I did with your one, right? And it's just synchronizing up there. And there it is. So over on the right hand side, you get a little emulator and it's showing you the app in real life. Now, if I open up my phone and load that up, you'll see. I hope you can see oh, a bit hard with that background thing, isn't it? You can see, you sort of see on my phone there. That, that's that's it on my phone, right? And and it, it uh, I might turn that off in a second. Okay, but that's what it's showing me now. If I click on any of these, so this ping pong table that's near my house, if I click on that, it opens up. It shows me the photo that I took. If I scroll down, it geolocates it to show me where it was actually found. So that's that's good. If I come in here and I click on the gallery. This is another view that I've created. This is just another way of looking at the same data. And if I click on map, it gives me a map of the local area and shows me the pins of all the places where I've taken photos. Now, that's pretty straightforward, I think. But let's go to this views thing over here. If I click on the views, you'll see that I have created uh, three different views, a gallery view, a list view, and a map view. And you can see down the bottom here, gallery view, list view, map view, right? So when you create one of these views by clicking on the plus button here, what it creates is the ability to create a different tab in the app, if you like. Now, this list view, let's have a look at that. The list view, I've used this layout called deck, which, so I'll go to it there and show you. So this layout is called deck. And if I go to gallery view, that uses a layout called gallery, and that looks like this. And if I go to map view, it uses the layout called map, and it looks like that. So, sorry, click on that. So it's pretty straightforward. I, I create a view. I choose the, the view type that I want. I can give it a name. If I, if I want it to be called something other than um, map, I can call it, uh, you know, bird's eye view or whatever I want to call it. I can give it a different name. Um, and then as you go down the page here, you just literally select all the different settings. So on the map view, for example, right now it's showing the mode called road, which is like the typical mode, but I could go aerial view and I could have it substitute the Google, uh, like the, the satellite view instead if I wanted to do that. So it's literally just a matter of once you, once you import your data source, once you create a couple of views, and then you go and set the settings for all those views, it just works. Now, how do you get it to work on your actual phone? So let me go over here to our original one here, which has no data in it. So that's the one we called local tracker, right? So local tracker has nothing in it right now, except we've linked it to a data source. And it has no real views in it other than 
default one it's created, which is using the deck view. So how do I get this on my phone? I'm signed in here with my Google Trainer account, which is just a Google account, right? And I go and click this little rocket button here, and I say move app to deployed state. As soon as you click that, it publishes the app. And then so long as I have the app sheet app on my phone, it shows up as one of the options in the app sheet app. Now, I'm going to try and make this work. Let's see if I can do this. This will be tricky. Uh, join with Google Meet. If I can make this work. Okay. Is that doing the uh, screen share from your phone, Chris, which is... I'm going to find a screen share from the phone, yeah. Super handy when you need to demo something, I find. It, like, it, you want to show people how it works in your phone. I'm just getting a little bit of echo, so I'm just going to plug something in here to stop the microphone. There you go. That should be better. Okay. Uh, right. So how do I share my screen? It is share screen. Start sharing. And start now. So I am going to do that. And so now, hopefully, what you guys see over on the left-hand side is my phone. Yep, you're all good. You can see my phone. Right? Yep, sure can. Okay, fantastic. So because I've gone into AppSheet on my computer and I've deployed the app, I can now come into, I think it's in this Google collection here, and it's in, so you can see the AppSheet app there. So I open that up, and I'm just going to go in here and, uh, which one do I go to? Oh, oh, I'll show you the app. This is this is the one I built. This is the one I pre-built, right? So you can see what I've got there. There's the app. I've got the three views. So there's the list view, the gallery view, and the map view. And this is just pulling directly from what I built on the web, right? Which, as you saw, literally took me a couple of minutes. Okay. Yes, I fiddled around with it a little bit last night to try and just fine tune the way I wanted to look. But basically, the app was built in in, in what three minutes. It was really quick. Um, I can get things there and switch to satellite view, switch to map view, and so on. If I go back to that list view, when you create a view, depending on the view, it creates automatically a number of sub views. So, for example, this sub view here, if I click on say this orange and yellow flowers, it's going to open up. To a deep what's called a detailed view that was created automatically for me i can i can sort of scroll up and down if i tap the photo it'll show me a, a view of the photo i can close the photo there's also a switch in here that lets you while you're in detailed view whether you want to allow people to swipe from side to side to go to the next one so that's that's a switch you can turn on and off okay and the other view you can get you can see down the bottom there's a plus sign so right now i'm going to click on that plus button and it opens up the data entry field. Again, this was created automatically for me. I didn't have to add anything or do anything. I can go in and tweak the way it looks if I want, but it was created automatically. So uh, I'm gonna create a, an object here. The object is desk, right? And the suburb, I'm currently in Ultimo. And the location, to track your location, you notice on the location field, which was imported automatically for me, there's a little marker pin. If I tap the marker pin, it will automatically get my location. If I click the photo button, it will use my phone, either take a photo, choose from an existing photo, it will go into my Google uh, Photos collection. But I'm just gonna say take a photo, and I'm just gonna go in here and take a photo of my desk. There you go, now you can see what this looks like. Okay, thank you, Darren, for waving. And I say okay, and that locks that in there. And if I wanna put any notes, I can say uh, my messy desk. Right, and say save, and that now saves. So you can see I've just added that as an entry. I click on that, there's the photo, I go back, there's that. If I need to edit that, there's an edit button, I can go and change any of those things. So I, I'm i not an app-making genius. All I know is that if you just create a sheet with the right columns in it and import it in, it pretty much just falls into place and does its own thing. It's not complicated. Where you find most of your time and effort spent with this is just fine-tuning the way the views work. And let me go back into that now and I'll show you exactly what I mean. But there you go. There's there's the gallery of images that I took and so on. And um, now, now, even that, now you can do a whole lot more with this. That You can integrate it with things. You can integrate it with AI. There's some AI integrations you can use. 
lots of things you can do with this. What I've just shown you, I think, is a really easy base level, dip your toe in the water, have a go at it. Um, but I think that idea of creating an app where you can go and capture things from your local area and take a photo and get the geolocation and put it on a map, I can think of a million uses for that in a classroom situation, right? Oh, my phone went to sleep. Okay. Uh, is there any questions on any of that stuff? No? Okay, good. Um, all right, now. Uh, so I am going to go stop sharing this thing. Chris, I think Andrew, um, was it Andrew had a, a question? Far away, Andy. Did you choose the green colour? Yes, I did. Let's go into that. So I'm going to go into the one that I've worked on. So this is the one that I just showed you that's on my phone, right? And in fact, if I come in here now and I just hit this little refresh button on that, you'll see it's resynchronizing to the to the spreadsheet. And if I go into my list view now, you should find at the top of this list there's my there's my messy desk. So it's a two-way sync. I took it on my phone, it's synchronized to the to the spreadsheet. If I go back into the spreadsheet, which is uh, this one, right? There's the desk, it just popped up there. There's the geolocation, there's there's the link to the images, which is being stored in AppSheet's image store, okay? And any comments and whatnot. So it, all of the stuff that I've just captured in the app automatically goes into the sheet, synchronizes back into the sort of the the um, um, the one that's working in the in the emulator. Now, you asked about a couple of things about how you change things. So if I, I'm just going to show you, if I go into the, the list view, for example, in the list view, which is that one, now depending on which view type you choose, you'll get different options below it. So when I choose the map one, remember I could switch between satellite view and, and, and sort of regular street view, a regular like map view. Um, Obviously, you don't get that option if you're not in map view. So depending on which one of these view types you choose will depend on the options you get below it. Now, because this is a list, one of the things you can choose is, well, how is it sorted? I want it sorted by date and time in descending order, so the newest thing is at the top. I could change it if I wanted. I could, I could say, let's put the oldest thing at the top, and you can see that list just... Uh, I'll change both of them. Oh, there you go. So that list just changed order, right? because I just, I changed it. So if I go descending, I'll do that. Let's add, I want to do it by date and time. So I'm going to choose time as one of the other things, make that descending. Uh, so now it's just, now it's sorting in the opposite order and you can see there it is. It's put the, the most recent thing at the top again. So that's one thing I can do. I can start to aggregate things if I want. So you might have things in different categories. So for example, all of, because I just did this in my local area, all the suburbs is Ultimo. But if I was collecting this from all different suburbs, I might want to sort that by suburb. So I can come in here and say aggregate this uh, by count and group it by, um, you know, is it group by, so you can group by subject, or su sorry, suburb. So when I do that, it's going to say, okay, there are 15 things in Ultimo. It's not anywhere else because they're all in Ultimo, right? But if I had other suburbs, it would group them together by suburb and then give me a count because I've asked it to do it here. Um, so all of these things, how, how the things display, that little um, that little icon there, of the, the lines for the list view, I just chose it from this list, just like I did for gallery and for map. Right? So all of that stuff is just choosable. Um, so that's how, you, that's how you manage the views. And again, if I go to gallery, you'll see gallery has a different set of settings. Map has a different set of settings, depending on what the, the view type is. You'll notice too that when I, remember how I said it automatically generates? So when I click on one of these things, I, uh, I get- Mr. Mr. Betcher, can I interrupt for a moment there? Would you like to share your screen with the uh, with the team? Oh, am I not sharing my screen? Oh, thank you, Steve. When you, when you, when you dropped out from the uh, from the phone view, yeah, you yeah, yeah, to, to share screen. No, no, no problem. I thought it was still doing it. Resume my presentation. Resume <laughs> presenting. All right, my apologies. My geez. Well, that wasn't very just instructive if I wasn't sharing my screen. Um, but uh, you'll see there, like, remember I mentioned, like, when you click on one of these automatically generated list views, when you click on it and it takes you into this automatically generated detail view, well, that's the detail view there. So if I click on that, you'll see this is how, this is how that view looks. 
And if I click on the, if I go here and click on the uh, plus button to go into this adding screen, well, there's the settings for that. That's called the main form. So all of these things automatically generated for you, and then you can go and tweak them if you like. Now, Andrew, you asked about the green thing. So up here under the settings here, there is a whole bunch of settings in terms of the overall properties of this app. So here you've got things like the information about the app. You can see this is version 1.00024. I've, I've changed this 24 times so far. I just keep tweaking it and saving it. Every time I save it, I'm assuming that will make it 25. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's gone to version 25 now. 0 0.0025. Um, so you put all your all your settings in there. If I click on the little thing there, I got go to the about page. It's got this like what this app is about. And again, you can see that where this is coming from here. Just you know whatever things you put in there, that's that'll appear in the app. Uh, under theme and brand, I can say well I want a dark theme or a light theme, or maybe I don't like the green. Maybe I want it to be in yellow, and it's going to replace all of that with yellow. Uh, and you can see that's now done like that. Hit save button. That was a blank thing. I don't need it. I'll throw that away. Yes, I'm sure. Okay. So, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Delete it. There you go. Um, you can choose the logo, the background image, uh, whether the view shows in the header. If I can turn that on and off, you can see uh, that, that word list disappears from there. So not complicated. You just basically go in connect it to a data source, and so long as the data source is consistent, it will pretty much do the rest of the work for you. But Andrew, I think I do like it in green more than yellow, so I'm going back to green. And hit the Save button, and that's saved. And it will resynchronize with the data. And when I open it on my phone, I can do that little pull down with your finger thing to resynchronize it on the phone as well. And it is literally as simple as that to build something easy. Now, I'm sure that to build something more complicated is going to be a way a lot harder. But um, how many of you reckon you could give that a go and make something happen? Andrew says yes. Leslie did this. <laughs> All right. Sharon, Karina, excellent. So there you go. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my little introduction there to you for AppSheet. Um, I think it's a really easy simple way to make stuff. Um, if I go back to the main list, uh, I'll just dabble with a few things. And you can pull in things like last night, I found a list of Pokemon. I just went to the internet and downloaded a list of Pokemon and then pointed app sheet to that and started to create a little database of Pokemon characters. I haven't finished it, I was just messing around with it. But you can see as it syncs up here, right, it's got uh, uh, come on, finish syncing. There you go. So there's a little little collection of Pokemon characters, right? Then when you click on one of them, you'll click on there, and you can go down there, and I, you know, hit add more, add more fields in there. You know, information, what, what, you know, Pokemon they're afraid of, and what their advantages are, and whatever else you like about Pokemon. All right, I reckon that's about it. Any questions? Leslie. Yeah, I have a question. So how you've, you've got those uh, plotted, those items plotted on a map that you've mm -hmm. walked around the block. Mm -hmm. So how specific can those plots be? Can it be like on a suburban house block or a farm block or how specific? Most unassisted GPS will probably... Uh, it, it, there's, there's a lot of factors. If you know how GPS works, it, it's triangulating off satellites. Uh, so it depends how many satellites it can see. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're in an open area where it can see a lot of satellites, uh, it's generally pretty accurate and usually usually within a couple of metres. Wow. Um, but if you are in a built-up area and there's tall buildings around and you can only see bits of the sky because not, not all the satellites get visibility, then, um, I don't know, five to ten metres maybe. It just depends. I'd like to try it. But looking at that, uh, if I if I go back to this thing that I did and look at the map, like knowing my local area as I do, and I look at those things, that's pretty accurate. I, I like I know if I if I turn on the uh, the satellite view, you know, there's a little park next to me, and I took a few things there, and I stopped. There's some plants along here. There's 
plants in the driveway down here, it's pretty accurate. It's, it's probably no more than a couple of metres out for what it's worth. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, we will move on. Okay. I will stop sharing that. I was just going to say, Chris, uh, there's also Duet that's been announced for AppSheet. I just had a look at that. That looks very, very cool. It does. It does. And I don't know the full details of that, but um, for those that have not heard, we just recently announced a thing called Duet AI. Uh, so I think if you, if you came to last month's um, Learn with Google, we showed you some of the integrations with AI inside Workspace. So like the, the, the Gmail and the Docs feature helped me write directly inside Gmail. So all of those assistive generative AI features um, that are going to be appearing within Workspace, we're, we're calling Duet AI, as it's kind of its marketing name. Um, uh, but yeah, as Darren pointed out, um, one of the features of that is Duet will be able to assist you with AppSheet. And in fact, even now, oh, I've stopped sharing now, but even now, like if I go and try and create a new view or something, a little AI will pop up and it'll say, it'll give me a couple of suggestions about different views that it thinks might be appropriate and it will automatically create them for me. So even AppSheet is AI enabled. Thanks for reminding me of that, Darren. I completely forgot. Uh, let me go back to our slides. Yeah, uh, actually. I won't share the tab, I'll share the whole thing like that. Okay. Uh, and then we'll make this go full screen like, like, like that. Okay. Um, so that was AppSheet. Uh, hopefully you got something of that. I'd love to hear what you make with it um, because it really is pretty easy. If, you, if, if that looked complicated, just give it a shot. Um, I think you'll be surprised at how easy it is. It really does a lot of the work for you. Uh, all with no code. All right. Um, down here. And I want to just share a few things that is new since we last spoke. Um, and the list is there, extended language support in me, new timeline capabilities in sheets, uh, picture in picture mode for meat, uh, and grading periods in classrooms, variable chips in docs, which is pretty cool, and class visits in classroom finally has been announced. Uh, if I can show you that, I will. And uh, also the ability to report inappropriate chat messages. So let's unpack some of those. Um, so first of all, Google Meet, uh, what we're using right now, um, you probably know it does uh, the closed captioning. Um, we've just introduced a whole bunch of other languages for closed captioning. So now there's French Canadian. <laughs> well, French people are very insistent that Canadian French and their French is not the same thing. Um, Indonesian, Polish, Romanian, Thai, Turkish, and Vietnamese. Uh, those languages are now supported. And we've also introduced additional language for the translated captions. So some of you know that if you've got the plus or teaching and learning version of Meet, you can turn on this mode where it will translate for you, not only do the captions, but turn them into another language so you can converse with someone in another language. Um, we currently support, I think, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, German. I think we might have Chinese in there, I'm not sure. Um, but we're just introducing Dutch, Indonesian, Turkish, and Vietnamese as well. And obviously we'll continue to expand those. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, in Google Sheets, there is a timeline view. Just wave at me if you've used the timeline view in Google Sheets. No, oh, I might show you what that is then. Um, so one of the things we've, we, I mean, we've just enhanced what currently it can do. We've just enabled some more formatting options. Um, you can do uh, cleverer things with the card text and the way that works, uh, especially if you've got long text in there and how it handles text being cut off. Uh, but I think the most exciting one there is, um, not that I'm encouraging you to print, but print and download support. Uh, often teachers would create like a timeline and then for whatever reason, they would like to have a printed version of that. Well, apparently now you can do that. You've got the ability to print and download those as well. Um, so that's neat. I'm just going to jump out of here for a second and show you in case you've not come across it. Uh, if I just open up sheets dot new and 
Yeah, so you'll find it in um, it's insert menu, insert timeline. So this timeline view here, so I have no data in the sheet, so I won't do anything particularly interesting, but uh, in fact, I won't do anything at all. Create a timeline. Uh, there you go. It's not a very interesting timeline um, because I don't have anything in the sheet. But if you had stuff in the sheet and it had a start date and an end date, it would actually create this timeline here for you. In fact, let's see if we can do it. We go into sheet. I'm just going to create a column here called uh, start, another column called end, and we'll call it item, and we'll call this one, um, I don't know, um, um, working, and we'll give it a start date of, hmm, what's today? The 15th of the 6th. Uh, 23 and we'll end it on the 20th of the 6th 23 and so now I've got some start and end dates in there I should with my timeline and make sure I get the whole sheet I yeah, just get the whole sheet Ooh. let's grab all of that okay cool now if I go to my timeline, it still doesn't like me. Due to data errors, no start or end date. Mm. Probably because I didn't. I, yeah, sorry guys. I'm trying to show you and I'm not doing a very good job. Let's go back to that sheet. Let's try that again. So we'll go insert timeline. Now that I've put some data in there, that's better. Say OK. And you can see there, so it's created a timeline there with me with a like a, a timeline bar across. And if I had other things in there, it would give me all different timelines. Good for historical, um, like historical timelines. There you go, there's that word. Uh, so that is timelines. It's got a whole bunch of new features in there in terms of being able to be printed and so on. So that's one of the things that's new. Uh, now, the other things, picture-in-picture uh, picture Meet for Chrome, uh, for Google Meet. Uh, I don't know whether you've used this or not, but if you would like to try it, if you go to the three dots menu in Meet, which is right next to the Hangout button, try not to hit the Hangout button, but go to the three dots in Meet, and when you go there, you will find there is a thing called Open Picture-in-Picture picture Mode. And when you click that, it will actually shrink this meet call into a little panel which floats on top of the screen that you can move around. Now, if you're lucky enough to work on a, a computer that has a spare screen, like an extra screen, this probably isn't that important to you because you can always see things on two screens. But if you're trying to do something in a meeting, if you're trying to work on a document while you're also trying to be in a call, having it in picture-in-picture -picture mode and having it float around the screen, way more convenient. And the change that we've introduced to this is that now uh, you should have the buttons along the bottom there. You can see them here. You've now got the ability to, to do your hand raising, turn your captions on and off, um, access the layouts and stuff from this menu right here. If you go to the three dots there, you'll find there's more options as well. Um, wave at me if, if that works for you. You've got that. Leslie, you've got it. I don't know if anyone else has tried it. But, yeah, that's the um, – thanks, Karuna. And Sharon, so that's, yeah, it's a nice thing there for having that floating around the screen. Great for when you're on a single screen. Uh, was that a chat message? I hear a thing going bleep, bleep. Oh. Okay, Darren's going off to make a flight. Excellent. Uh, all right. Um, what's next? Uh, oh, um, this is a new thing in Google Classroom. Uh, when you're creating your grades in Google Classroom, you can now actually create uh, grading periods. So up until now, when you're putting tasks in Google Classroom, uh, you really had to, like, it was just treated as one big lump of tasks. Now you can actually create grading periods. So you might create, so period one, period, sorry, uh, term one, term two, and so on, and you can group your categories into those different um, uh, time periods and then grade them by the time periods. Uh, and someone had a hand up. Uh, where is it gone? Um, 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 um. No? Okay. I thought someone had a hand up. 
yeah, and as you can see in the little graphic there, that when you uh, when you go to the grade book view, then you can actually from the drop down list, you can actually drop it down and view a specific time period. So you maybe just want to see term one or just term two, and you can have the grading not carry across if you like. Something people have been asking for for a while, and that's available to the teaching and learning and the plus editions of Workspace. Um, this just came out last well last couple of weeks. It's called variables. Uh, you've probably heard us talk a lot about the uh, idea of smart chips. We've talked a lot about smart chips over the last little while, and we keep introducing new smart chips. Um, so let me come out of here and just show you what they do. Uh, so I'm just going to go create a new document with docs.new. And in here, you've got under the insert menu, you've got all these smart chips, right? And so uh, some of the new ones that have come out is timers and stopwatches, and I'm not sure if we've talked about them or not. I think they might be new as well. So timer is an interesting one. So if you go timer, it'll actually put a timer directly on the page. Uh, this is great for agendas, where you actually put a little timer next to everyone, so that, uh, people stick to time, and you can just click that button there and it'll tick away on the time there just like that, and just when it runs out, it just goes to zero and people know the time is up. So that's one type of uh, smart chip that we've introduced. Uh, there's also um, uh, there's also stopwatch, which is similar to the timer. Uh, but this is the one I want to show you, variables down here. If I go to variables, and I can create what's called a variable. Now, a variable is just a piece of text that represents another piece of text. So just like in computing or just in algebra, right? it represents something else. So I might create a variable here called um, uh, first name, create, and I might create another variable called, um, let's go insert smart chip variable, let's call this one uh, last name, and we'll create one more and we'll call it insert smart chip variable. Uh, what else can we do? We can put um, uh, school, okay? And then we, then we can use those. Can we change, modify the building blocks like meeting notes? Uh, sure. In fact, uh, Shafkat, I hope I said that right. Uh, let me show you. I think it's not listed, but building blocks is another, custom building blocks is another new thing we've just announced. So let me just show you that. So um, once you've done that, you can say, dear, and then insert first name. So insert first name, insert last name. Um, I hope you enjoy teaching at, and then insert school name, right? And so it's, it's essentially like a, a mail merge, except sometimes you don't need a mail merge where you're actually merging a ton of stuff. You only want to merge like just for one example. So for example, I might say here, first name is um, Leslie and last name. Leslie, can I use your last name? Yes. So I put that in there. You can see as I'm as I'm inserting them in here, anywhere that those variables appear, it substitutes in something. So Leslie, your school is the um, uh, the the veggie garden. Yeah, they'll do. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see as I'm doing that, it's substituting that in. So I find this I, I use this quite a lot now, and I find them really useful, especially when you're creating um, something that that uses the same. Uh, and it tries to insert the same words over and over again. So you might have a letter and you mention the person's name four or five times within the letter, right? Rather than typing it in, you just create a variable, substitute it in, and it substitutes into that letter. And then, um, you know, if you need to make the letter for someone else, you just go and change it once in place and it slides back throughout the, the whole thing. So I find them really time saving, uh, really good. Now, an answer to your other question, you asked about these building blocks. And can you can you modify the building blocks? Um, I think you can. But what I want to show you is if I was to get uh, create some, let's go insert a table with say three rows like that. Oops, no three rows, still like that. Come on, enter. What? what is going on today? There you go. That'll do. So I'll create the uh, red, blue green and I might put something in there I might put 
something in there like insert a smart chip that's uh, or drop, let's insert a drop down and the drop down will be project status I'll just stick one of those in there right I'll stick another one there uh, insert smart chips sorry not smart chips drop down I'll just see another project status one in there, right? So you can create all of this, however you want to do that. You can you can fancy it up. You can make make things formatted or whatever. So you do all that. Now here's the thing with this custom building blocks. Let's say this particular little block here is something you used regularly, right? So that you don't have to create it all the time from scratch. If you simply select it all like so, then right click on it and say save as a custom building block. What it'll do is it'll take that chunk of stuff, whatever it is, and I'm going to call this um, uh, my my block of stuff. All right, call it whatever you like. Describe it if you want, and say create. Okay, so that's done. So now the next time I'm in a document somewhere, I'm just going to come down the page a bit. All right, just get clear of that. All right, and I want to I want to insert the same thing again. Rather than create it again, I go insert building block, custom building block, and I want to do this one called my block of stuff, and boom, there it is. So it's a really nice, easy way to create reusable chunks of Google Doc that you can just insert. It's like a template, right? You just create little mini templates that you can just drop onto the page wherever you need. So hopefully that answers your question. Can you modify the original ones? I don't know, but it's easy enough to just make your own new ones and then just turn that into a custom building block if that's what you need to do. I forget who asked that question. It might have been, no, I forget. Sorry, but I hope I've answered you. Uh, and let's go back to here, and we're nearly done. We've got, that's the smart chips. Oh, the visitor class in Google Classroom. Um, this is new. Which account am I using? Uh, I think I've got it in this one. So let me show you this. If I go to Classroom, one of the problems of Google Classroom has always been that if you are the principal or in leadership position at a school and you want to know what's going on in any classroom, up until now, you've had to be made a member of that classroom. So if I go into this demonstration class, for example, and I look at who are the people in this class, you can see I've got a number of teachers in this class that are teachers in this class. But what if, like you notice, the principal is not in this class. So if the principal wants to see what's happening in this class, they up until now, they've had to be made a member of the class. Now you don't need to do that. And here's how it works. If I go in here, there's a new feature here called Visitor Class. And if I click on that, I can come in here and search by any teacher or student or email address within the domain. Now, if you're in a school, that's the whole school. If you're in a system like the Lismore Diocese or the New South Wales Department of Education or whatever, like this searches across the entire domain. So, for example, I know I've got a teacher in here called Kimberly Hall, right? And Kimberly has a class in here that I am not a teacher in, but I need to see what's going on in that class. So I can come down here and go, okay, here's this, this class here, this demo class where she is the primary teacher. If I go into that class. Now, when you're visiting someone else's digital classroom, it wouldn't be very nice if you were just dropping in and out and people would have no idea about it. I, I think as a teacher, I would feel justifiably upset if I thought the principal was just dropping in and out of my class to see what was going on and I was unaware of it. So if you're visiting a class, you do need to say why you're visiting. So it might be to just um, provide teacher support, let's say. So I can go and visit that class now. That opens that class up like so. So I'm now inside Kimberly's class, and you know, if I go to the People tab here, you'll see I am not a teacher in this class. I just have temporary access to this class by going through the class visit. Now, once I'm in here, I can assign a, a, a substitute teacher for the day. I can check on what's happening with a particular student, right? I've got full access to the class for, I believe it's 24 hours, and then it just kicks me out again. So I think that's that will really streamline a whole bunch of things for teachers that um, you know have always been a bit problematic up to now because no one wants. I've heard so many principals complain to me and say I don't need to be a member of every single class inside my school. I just need to be able to go and see something if I need to, and this now solves that problem. So that's so, the. So yeah. quick, can I, quick question there. Uh, so does Kimberly, the class teacher, 
see, you know, that some sort of history that you've been in for 35 minutes, uh, even though you're you know, registered and said, this is why I'm going in there. So she's away today. She's mm. coming in tomorrow and she sees that, does she see uh, evidence of you popping in and giving the, uh, the, the substitute teacher uh, a little bit of support by taking them through that class? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I do know that when you go in here, you've got to say why you came in here or add your own message to say why. Uh, let's go here to learn more about this class. Um, well, as you say, you know, that, that you know, it is polite to do. And uh, if you don't get to see Kimberly when she comes to school and she says, what's Chris Betcher doing in my classroom all day? Yeah, interesting. Actually, I, I think I said 24 hours. It's not. It's two hours. So you get access for two hours at a time. That's a good time. Okay. So sorry, I made that mistake. Um, but yeah, I, that's a good question about what's actually logged in terms of what visitors do. I don't know that it is, but um, it's a good good question. I'll try and find out the answer for you. So that's that's the class visits, um, and and of course, if you just want to look up a student, so if I look up I've got a student here called Helen, I can click on Helen. So again, if I'm the principal or or a, you know counselor or something, and I just want to check on a student, I can come in here. I can see Helen, I can see all the classes she's enrolled in. If I want to drop into any of those classes, I can click on that and go into that class and see what's happening within that student's class. Or or what I'm because I look for my student, I'm actually seeing this student's participation in that class, including all the work she's missing, what hasn't done, and so on, what her average grade is. Nice way to just drop in and see what's going on. So does that allow someone to then copy your class? Uh, no. I don't believe so. Good question. Can we test it? Is it a class? I'll go back to Kimberly's class again. Kimberly Hall. Uh, go back into this class. Let's say I just want to do that. And so I think to copy a class, you can only do it from that main screen mm -hmm. with all the blocks on it. I don't think you can copy a class from in here. So you know, if I like, if I go back here to just my regular classroom view, which sorry is over here, and I go to yeah. my classes list. So the way you copy a class is to go to these three yeah, dots, yeah. copy yeah. the class, right? But if if I'm in the class itself, as a as a visitor, I have no way to copy that class. Okay. Yep. So I think the answer is no. I was just thinking of stalkers. Yeah. <laughs> so Chris, just to clarify, because I might have missed it. Well, I was trying to see if I had that <laughs> option. Um, so can any teacher uh, go into another person's class or is it a level of, you know, role of manager of the school? Did I make uh, that? There is. That's a good question too. I believe there is a hierarchy yeah. uh, managed in the admin console to say who has the ability to... Yeah, good visit classes yeah it's not just anybody good but you can designate who those people are yeah 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 uh and just finally um there's been a couple of changes in the admin console too to the settings for the chat feature so i don't know how many of you are using chat within a school uh whether it's for teachers or even for students probably not for students i don't know um but there's now a lot more uh settings in there where you can report things such as harassment, rude behaviour, sensitive information and more. So if, if someone sees something in chat that they're not happy with, there's now a button that they can report that and that button and how it flows and where that information goes to is customisable in the admin console. So a little thing, but an important thing. And I think that brings us to the end of today. So that was that was pretty full today. I'm sorry for doing all the talking. I normally have other members of the team to share that with me, but uh, Kimberly's on a plane, Steve's in a meeting, Darren's doing something else. So, uh, sorry, you're stuck with me today. Um, we've got more things coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, next month, we're talking about telling stories with place and space. Uh, there'll be a lot of stuff in there about mapping and Google Earth and things like that. Uh, I'm sure Steve will be stepping into that because that's his favourite tool of everything. Um, so, yeah, join us next month on the 20th of July if you can. Uh, to talk about telling place and space and if you haven't um, uh, I'll send out a reminder every month to everyone who's registered just to let you know this is on uh, if you have friends or uh, other teaching colleagues who you think might benefit feel free to pass this on um, the more the merrier 
And if you want access to any of our past webinars there, you can see there's a playlist available there if you want to scan that uh, or just... Um, uh, did I give you the slides? I think I put the link to the slides in. Let me do it just in case I did not. And I'll just go to the chat and pop it in right there. There you go, there's a link to the slides. And in the slides, you'll have the link to everything else. Uh, so that's cool. And then um, just finally, if you want a certificate for attending today, and I know some people do, uh, if you go there to bit.ly slash GFE certificate, capital G, capital E, and just fill in the form, it'll automatically generate one for you and send it to you. It's an honor system, so you've been here for an hour. Uh, and that is that. Um, we are at time, but I'm going to hang around for a couple of minutes. If anyone has any questions, I will stop the recording and um, and just answer any questions. Other than that, thank you, everyone, for joining us again today. It's been fun.